is where Paul talks about this war that's raging inside of him because the good that he wants to do that he can't do and the bad that he doesn't want to do that's the stuff he keeps on doing. So we'll be focusing on that. We have our worksheet for today is session 23. Who is a Christian is the subtitle of what I titled it. Um, and then we'll launch into other questions. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day that you brought us into. We thank you especially for the fellowship that you've gathered us in as, as we are your children, purchased and won by the blood of your Son. And, and how even in spite of our sin and our brokenness that we display throughout our life, especially these last few days and weeks, you continue to move to us. And the bad that we don't want to do, that's the stuff that we keep doing, but yet you're, you're merciful and kind and continue to forgive us and continue to restore us to yourself. And Lord, we ask that you lead and guide us in this conversation as we see you alone as, as the <coughs> one who can provide us relief from these bodies of death that we have. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'll go ahead and read this. So um, for this first question, we have a few other readings. Um, Acts chapter 20, verses 19 to 26. And then Acts chapter 25, verses 8 to 10, and then verse 17. And then a great one, 1 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4. Uh, so if you feel so compelled today, uh, please uh, I'll look those up and I'll ask the volunteers to read those as we get to there. But here is Romans 7, verses 14 and following. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not want to... For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desires to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want. The evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find this to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Okay. This so the question that we have in front of us to start us out as we look at this section is the following. After reading through this section of Romans, how does Paul's proclaimed guilt not contradict what he says in other places about his innocence. So the question is, as we read through this, if Paul, especially in Romans 6 and 5 and other places, has already talked about how he has been set free, that he died to sin, rose to life in his baptism, and faith alone gives him a relationship to God, how is he not contradicting himself here by saying that he is condemned because of sin and lives according to the flesh. So let's see what Acts chapter 20. Here's just a few examples of Paul talking about how he's innocent. So Acts chapter 20 verses 19 to 26. Does someone have that one for us? Yeah, right. <coughs> Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the flocks of the Jews. Just the right how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance through God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, 
If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. Okay. Pretty bold statement. How about Acts 25, verses 8 to 10? Acts 25, 8 to 10. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the laws of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? <coughs> Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. Can you do verse 25? And verse 25? Oh, 17, sorry. 17, okay. So when they came together here, I made no delay. But on the next day, took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. All right, now let's switch to uh, second, yeah, First Corinthians four, three and four. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself. But I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Wow. That is, I love that passage, and I you know, use it from time to time too, about how bold it is for Paul to say, I don't even judge myself. Have you seen that, Caesar? No, he's saying, he's, this is in his letter to, uh, he's seen Caesar. Not yet, not by the time that we have, have seen it. So, in Acts chapter 20, that's on his way to Jerusalem. Right? And then in Acts 25, that's where he's standing. I believe it's in Antioch, isn't it? Where he's at being, standing in front of the, the tribunal of Festus on his way through. Um, and on his way to Rome uh, to stand before, uh, before the emperor. Because he's a Roman citizen. Uh, but in 2 Corinthians, he's writing to talk about uh, his, about those who judge him. Um, and or, or count him worthy, or look back on his past and see him as a, you know, vilify him as Paul, the persecutor of the church. And here he he says something really, really startling. He says that he's innocent. And here in Second First Corinthians, he goes so far as to say that you know, even if you judge me, that's such a light thing. I don't even consider it worthy to think about. Essentially, could you imagine if we had, were able to instill that into? In the society, that you really didn't it didn't matter what other people really were judgmental of you, you know. But anyways, so then um, he even goes a step further and says, "I don't even judge myself because it's the Lord alone that judges." What a powerful thing to say! How many of you guys judge yourself? And it's because we're such a, we have such a great memory of the things we've done. Uh, or maybe we see ourselves through the lens of worldly expectations. And so we judge ourselves and we weigh that heavy burden on us all the time. But yet here, Paul tells us he doesn't even judge himself. What a liberating thing. Because what, what actually defines whether or not he's guilty or innocent is Jesus himself. He alone is the judge. That's how said how the first Corinthians passage turns. But Paul knew the Ten Commandments, and I, I, that's, I don't know. I, I have a hard time thinking that he would ever, ever judge himself. Well, yeah. Okay. And uh, it's a very bold. By the way, there's three half gallons of milk in the refrigerator. Lawyer <laughs> will get this and will erase this if he wants some milk. And it's very good. And it's very good. Yeah, it's, good. it's the good stuff, top shelf milk. But I don't think it's in the top shelf. It's in a box in there. Help yourself to it. Load up your car. Is it cow milk? I think it's cow milk. Yeah. All right. 
So here is the, the, the thing of Romans 7 that he's talking about. So that's God. Here's, a, here's Paul. Right? And so when Paul is looking at himself uh, and examining himself in Romans 7, he is focusing on this person. He's focusing on the I. Just listen to how many times he uses the word I in this text. Because he's looking at himself as the individual. But not only that, he's also giving us a statement of faith in the confession for you and I to insert ourselves, our eyes, in here. But look at all these eyes that's put in there. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin the law that is in me. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so in Romans 7, he's focusing on the condition of this person. Not we. Yeah, and not we, right? It's just like when you get to the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed of the worship service, it's I believe. Because you can't believe for somebody else. And here, Paul is talking about him, making a confession of who he is, a poor minister of sin. Again, when we have the confession and the absolution, I poor miserable sinner. It's the only individual thing that we really profess to do. Is he judging himself? Yes, right? Because he's focusing on this. With the rest of the text that we're looking at, he is looking at the full counsel of who he is through God. So he is forgiven and redeemed. And he is looking at himself as God looks at him. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, I don't even judge myself, because how fruitful is it to spend all your time thinking about how you're a poor, miserable sinner? It's good in one respect, because it reminds you of the importance of that cross. And that's the, the, the whole point of sin uh, and, and the law right now, is it directs us back to the cross. But as Paul is talking of, about him moving back to Jerusalem and proclaiming uh, the gospel, he's proclaiming the innocence that he has now because he's redeemed by the blood of Christ. And so he's not contradicting himself with these opening passages. He's talking about a Christian paradox that we experience every day. Because are you perfect? No. If we were looking at ourselves outside of our relationship to Jesus, we would see ourselves as lost and broken. We would see ourselves doing the things that we hate. And all we would have is the law to continue to tell us what the expectations are. And we would want to do the good things that the law says. But the sin that lives in us has us bound to a different law, and that's the law of the flesh. And so he's talking about this. And that's why he says, who will rescue me from this body of death? Because without Christ, all we have is this. So the last question, as he's zeroing in on this, you can imagine if we were in a dark room and the flashlight was just focusing right here, what Paul does with the last verse in verse 25 of chapter 7 is takes a couple steps back, and now the pan of the flashlight is like this. And now you see, thanks be to God. Actually, it would be a weird looking flashlight. But uh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. So that sick person out here should be us. Yes. Yeah. And that's why we, this is why I titled this section, Who is a Christian? Because that's what Paul is talking about. The Christian is the I in this text. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus. And so when you and I make these statements and confession of who we are, we find ourselves aligned with Paul's words, you know, uh, absolutely every step of the way. The good that I want to do, that I can't do. I want you so desperately. But I always fall short. Remember I told you the story about that lady reading the book of Joel Steen's 12 Steps of a Better You, and she says that she always stops about halfway through because she's just not good enough to finish the book. 
The expectations that are laid out there are just too lofty for her to attain. She was making the confession there on that airplane with me about Romans 7. The good I want to do, and even the stuff I dedicate my life to do, I can't do it. But it's really easy for me to do all the other stuff that I don't want to do. That just comes naturally to me, because what lives inside of me? Sin. Sin. And that's what Paul says. Death is at work inside of me. Sin is inside of me, waging war against my mind and spirit. And so you have this Christian paradox. We call it saint and sin at the same time. Right? Is that we are constantly sinners, constantly broken, constantly unable to do what's expected and what's good and right and salutary. But thanks be to God, to our Lord Christ Jesus, that we have been set free. What's interesting, too, let's just go to that. I just kind of just popped into my head. Let's see here. So you have all of those I verbs. Right? Not verbs. I pronouns. Individualistic. Sinner, sinner, sinner. All the way through. And then you get to verse 25. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our because where sin breaks down and divides every single person, but levels every person against uh, as a sinner and broken and dead, it also severs and breaks relationships with everybody else. It's only through Christ that we have communion with one another. And what unites us. This has been one of the big kind of bandwagons I've been on where we talk about our culture and society that's so divisive. So divided. And everybody, you know, they talk about coming together around this and around that. There's only one thing that could gather us together. There's only one thing that levels the playing field for every race, every ethnicity, every age, every gender. It's the fact that I cannot, by my own reason and strength, believe in the Lord Christ Jesus will come to him. And the good that I want to do, I can't do. It doesn't matter if you're a female uh, that lives in Belize or if you're a white Norwegian uh, man that lives up northern Minnesota. It doesn't matter. Right? But thanks be to God for our Lord Christ Jesus. Because we have our Lord that unites us together. That's a, the imagery of the common cup. I know that some people don't take the common cup as the idea it kind of throws us about. But the, the reality of it is, is you, you're taking from the same cup. You're drinking the same blood. My forgiveness is the same as your forgiveness. And the sins that I've done this week, this year, this life, they, they receive the same grace as yours. He unites us all, not in our sins, but in his salvation from us. So thanks be to God. Jesus is, is 
talking about who he is, um, but yet the, the irony is no one sees him for his truth, and they accuse him of, of his preaching lies, being the son of the devil, and all that other stuff. And the irony is he's speaking truth, and they're being accused of uh, he's being accused of being a lie. So. Okay, so let's keep going a little bit. So no, he doesn't contradict himself. He's talking about this more, this Christian paradox of being a sinner and a saint at the same time. And he's talking in Romans 7 about who he is outside of this. This is why he ends it with, thanks be to God for Christ Jesus. And you can imagine how powerful these words were for Paul, who considers himself a Pharisee, Pharisee, or a zealot, passionate about how he was better than everybody else in keeping the law. He alone could boast in being such a perfectionist when it came to observing the Mosaic laws. But yet then he read, he writes these words of Romans 7. I was a wretched person. I didn't do anything good. Nothing good lives in me. So these, these words must have startled the, the, the hearers, especially the Jews in the, in the uh, Roman church that were trying to get the Gentile Christians to start incorporating the legal system, the Jewish legal system, back into the acts of worship, saying that they need to depend on that in order to be saved, these words must have just shocked them to the core. Yeah. Before his conversion, he was actually living under that Old Testament yeah. part of it. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And very much not looking at this. Right? Because he was a Pharisee, so what he was looking for was a warrior king to come into Jerusalem and make the empire, the Roman Empire, get pushed out and reestablish the, the country Israel as a military power like David. So that's All right, so the next passage, or our next question, is this. Read 1 Corinthians 9.27 and then 2 Corinthians 4.11. And how do these passages help describe the battle Paul experiences every day within himself? We have a volunteer for that. Well, I just put my body, you keep it under control. Thus, after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Alright, how about the second Corinthians passage? I can read that one. Second <coughs> uh, Corinthians, uh, the first one? It's 4 11. Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So it disciplines us 
body than you can demonstrate. Jesus body. Yeah. Well, what does it look like to discipline your body? Maybe fasting? Well, if you have some extra poundage. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what he's talking about? No. What's he talking about? Going back to the fruits of the spirit, okay. So what's he talking about? Self-control. Right? And um, and I think that's that's a that's a big thing. You know, when we talk about it, and he, he describes it as a wrestling match or disciplining his body. And something that isn't easy. And something that's ongoing. Have you ever arrived as a Christian? No, right? Are you ever going to be free from that wrestling match? Yeah, it's a whole different thing. We'll, we'll cover that. 
talked about here with Paul. Why are we, why do we do this? Why do we come here and learn? Why do we, why do we walk beside each other in each other's lives and encourage one another? It's not for nothing. We do it because all of us need to continue to discipline ourselves because our fleshiness lives inside of us. Me alike, just like you. And so we encourage one another, as long as the day is called today, to, to hold on to this paradigm. That yes, you wrestle. You wrestle all the time. But that wrestling match doesn't define you. What defines you is the victory. Through Christ Jesus, that's a thanks be to God. Not part. Let's keep going. Let's see what we can do. We've got 10 more minutes. So how is it that only a Christian can say what Paul confesses with these passages in Romans 7, especially regarding the law? How could only a Christian say these things? Because the paradigm, Christ is in the Exactly. This is not, so when Paul is talking and he's using the word I, he is speaking on behalf of all Christians, really, and really uttering words for us to emulate and for us to uh, even speak back. Um, it's not just talking about, he's not talking about the world right now. He's not talking about the world, how it's lost and full of sinners like he was in Romans 1, and talking about how corrupt everything is. No, he is talking about Christians. And Christians alone are the ones that live inside this paradigm. Because outside of being a Christian, all you have... Is God looking down on the good that I can't do? And that's where we're going to be at the end of chapter 7. Anyway. Well, that takes us back to the Old Testament. Yep. Yep. Well, and, and worse, because not only does it take us back to the Old Testament, but we are rejecting this person. Right? We, and so that's added to it. We're basically telling God, I don't need. And that's, that's what happens in that situation. Any thoughts or questions about that?
because you get to a point in your life when you realize you cannot save yourself. And not only that, but you don't want that responsibility. Do you want your eternal salvation in your own hands? That would be a disaster. Right? You know? Yeah. Changed his mind, right? 
He's called, they're calling to see for Grandpa to say what Grandpa needs to say, because they need to hear it, and they know it's true. Right? And they have a relationship with you. And Grandpa and Grandma can plant the seed, but and you don't judge. Exactly, because we're not the judge, right? right. Jesus is the judge. So the big thing is, is how do you how do you do this? This is why you know there used to be in the chaplain's war um, after World War or in World War II. That's when you know really things um, uh, there was a lot of fascinating things that happened around World War II in the institution of the chaplains in the army. Um, but in the chaplain's corps, there was a campaign and a slogan kind of that made up their uh, made up their foundation. And it was just cooperation without compromise. I remember one time I was uh, asked by some local churches to uh, can help them conduct a prayer service and a, and a worship service in the community. And so this uh, other pastor came and asked me if I would do it. And I said, sure, as long as I, when I cooperate, I won't compromise on any of my doctrine. And they went away and they said, oh, that's so great that you're so willing to do all this stuff. And then they talked to an older pastor said, uh, that means he's not going to help you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but there you go. And so the thing is, is being able to pray for guidance and leadership and, and for God to give you the words to speak, to give you the opportunity to live um, and without compromise. Right? Because that's not what we're called to do. We don't compromise on, on truth. We never should do that. But how do we get along in terms of have Thanksgiving dinner um, and make our presence known without building this wall, this shell so thick that, that we would never be able to penetrate? Because the, the truth of the matter is, and this is something that I continue to see, is there's an old saying that says, the life is the greatest preacher. Because as thick of walls as we put up and say we don't need a Savior, life comes to us time and time again, believers and unbelievers, and busts that shell wide open and reminds us that we are desperately in need of a second Savior. And so sometimes it's just waiting for the right crack. And sometimes it's, it's knowing that there might be a time when they surprise you and call, and call on you and have a conversation with you because you didn't compromise. You had a question, sorry. I work with um, teenagers with mental health disorders, and last week um, we had three out of the four kids that were there transgender. Mm -hmm. And we had a discussion in Bible study at my church one time, and I talked about having these kids with these issues and how kind of what you said earlier, um, how do you look at these people and I, you know, prayed and prayed about it, and the only thing that I can come up with is that I am the light of Jesus in their lives. And I, my pastor said, when we were in Bible class one time, amidst all these people, he said, you need to get a different job. <laughs> and I'm like, no, absolutely not. I need to be, somebody in their life needs to be the light of Jesus. And I'm not going to be there just because they are. Exactly. Assuming. And that's what, you know, I, depending on the situation, some of you have heard me say to you, you might be the only chance they get to life. Right? You might be the only one. The yes, you know, they're going to be bombarded by the rest of the world, but you were placed there for a reason. And if they don't want to be, if they don't, this, I, I've said this as quite like people too. You don't want a Christian as a part of this community or agency or group. You just let me know. Right? Because I can arrange that. Right? But until then, until you just come out and say, Christians aren't allowed to be in this situation, then I'm going to continue to do that. No compromise. No compromise. And you better believe that the first time an agency or a school district says, we don't want Christians to be a part of it, it's going to be all over the news. You know, because we don't, we're not quiet people. We have to love the sinner. Yeah. 
not and hate the city. And that's why you're there. And even when you go talk about your counseling, right, is that you're there for the kids. You're not there so that you can have a job and be comfortable and <laughs> not be confronted with difficult situations. Being a teenage school counselor, that sounds like a pretty noble task. Right? I mean, you think of, I mean, just, I mean, that's just, that's, that's great. And you're doing it for the kids. So if you're there genuinely for the kids and to love the kids, then you share truth with them. And so, there you go. All right, guys, good conversation. Did we do all of it? No. But we'll do it all the same next week. And uh, we'll finish with the last question. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today, uh, for the calling that you've given us, not to hide ourselves or, or go into isolation, but to be your light into the world. And we know that without you, we have no idea what that looks like. But you promised that in the times when we'll be uh, confronted with tension and, and anxious and anxiety, held in front of tribunals or wherever, you will give us the words to speak. And we ask that you give us a reassurance of that. Uh, continue to give us that hope of knowing that regardless of the circumstances of this life, we are yours. And we ask that you bless us as we return back to either our homes now or upstairs to praise and worship you. And we ask this, Lord, all in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.